So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our special uh, holiday season edition of the Compass Seminar on this Monday morning. Our invited speaker today is Gunnar Spreen at the University of Bremen. And uh, we have known each other for more than 20 years. He got a a diploma degree in physics at the University of Hamburg in 2004. And I, I think he started to work as a student assistant for the remote sensing group there uh, of Werner Alpers uh, in 1999. So that's where I met him uh, for the first time. And uh, so after finishing his degree in physics, he um, came to our Institute of Oceanography as a PhD student and got his doctor degree in uh, 2008. Uh, I think just, uh, just after I had left the group, he got his uh, doctor degree. Then he went to uh, Caltech, NASA JPL for four years as a postdoc in the climate, ocean and solid earth science section. Then in 2012, he went to Tromsø in Norway as a permanent research scientist in sea ice remote sensing at the Norwegian Polar Institute. And then in 2015, he returned to Germany and joined the University of Bremen um, as the head of a junior research group at the time uh, group with the name Remote Sensing of Sea Ice in the Institute of Environmental Physics. And that's the group that publishes these daily uh, polar ice concentration, sea ice concentration maps based on uh, radio, uh, passive radiometer uh, data, uh, microwave radiometer data. Maybe you have seen those uh, maps. They have done that for a long a time. So he became group uh, head there and since 2016 uh, he's the head of the group remote sensing of polar regions so maybe that's just a name change i don't know so he's still there in bremen in this uh, position uh, quite uh, productive he has published uh, 64 peer-reviewed papers and he is still working on uh, sea ice remote sensing and uh, since he published some nice uh, pictures on facebook from his trip on uh, Polarstern uh, drifting through uh, the ice. I thought that's a perfect uh, holiday season presentation for us here in Miami. It's, well, we don't have a lot of ice and snow uh, for, uh, for the holidays. So it's always good to have a presentation on some ice and snow. So um, I think this will be very nice and uh, you can take it over now, Gunnar. Yeah, thank you very much, Roland, for this nice introduction. And yes, I will have some pictures of snow and ice. So, uh, okay, let's see. No, I'm on the wrong screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, welcome to this uh, summary presentation um, showing a few results of this mosaic expedition, the International Arctic Drift Expedition. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm presenting this, but this is really work done by uh, mainly what I'm showing the ICE team um, doing yeah, research on snow and ice uh, during mosaic. And I will also focus a little bit on remote sensing um, experiments where I'm mainly involved. In. And as I don't know how familiar you are with this expedition, um, I'm moving, I have to, sorry, I have to move here a few windows around, okay. So uh, what is Mosaic? Um, it stands for what most people cannot remember, including me, Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. 
And it's really an interdisciplinary expedition um, here in this graph, which we have done before we started the expedition, we put all these different measurements together. So it's um, interdisciplinary from the atmosphere, then, then us, what we are doing, snow and ice, uh, the ocean, and then biogeochemistry and ecology and also remote sending, aircraft observations and modeling. So um, it's the first time that a research icebreaker was frozen in close to the North Pole and drifted with the ice for, for, one season, uh, for one year. And not only one icebreaker was involved in that, actually in total were five icebreakers because we had to resupply um, Polarstern, the German icebreaker and also exchange personnel. So then there were two helicopters on board and um, there were also flights with two polar aircraft crafts, um, uh, not really reaching us, but flying into the direction of the drift camp. So in, in total 70 institutes are involved and they are coming from 20 nations. And there were, were about 450 people on board. At one given time, there are 100 people, roughly a bit more than 40 uh, crew members and um, 60 scientists. Um, yeah, and then this was exchanged um, and we had five legs, so four times, and the total bu budget is uh, around 140 millions. So how did that look? Uh, we left from Tromsø here, went into the ice uh, north of the Laptev Sea and started then our drift uh, for one year. In the beginning, it was quite slow, so now we, we are in December. But then I will come back to that. It was a bit unusual year, the year 2019, 2020, um, with a very negative AO. And we had a very fast drift then in the middle of the winter towards Fram Strait. So we were expecting to be um, basically in this area only by the end of the drift. But that um, time was already reached when actually pull up, um, Corona hit. And then there was, we had to leave um, the ice for an exchange with personnel because actually there yeah, are two, two reasons. We couldn't be reached by aircraft because um, um, the, all the airports were closed on Svalbard. Um, so, so Corona was one of the reasons, but the other reason was also that there was not a really good um, runway on the ice. The ice was very dynamic and was hard to maintain a runway. So Polarstern had to leave the ice one time, uh, but many instruments stayed on the flow. And after about five weeks, I think, or six weeks, we went back, drifted again, but then the drift was faster than expected. Um, the flow disintegrated here in Fram Strait. And then we went on by machine, so um, sailed towards the north again, and then one month of drift again here close to the North Pole. Okay, this is just short. Um, yeah, this shows uh, how we expected our drift to be. So that's roughly where we have started, where this black star is. And these are the last uh, 14 years how the drift would have been based on satellite ice drift estimates um, from that point where we started. And the colors give you the months of the year or from, from the starting point. So in general, you can see that we um, should have been here. Um, yeah, and, and so that is December uh, and the um, expedition was supposed to end in, in September, end of September, that all these trajectories basically stayed within the Arctic basin. There were only very few getting close to the Fram Strait, but most of them were in a quite safe place. But uh, as we have learned, 2020 then was different. We drifted much faster and ended up down here already in end of July, 30th of July, the flow disintegrated. So a quite straight drift, I would say. Also, we had high drift speeds, but um, the main uh, difference to the other years is that this was a very direct drift to, the, um, to Fram Strait. Okay, yeah, here you see the different legs again. So each color is one of these legs. And uh, during um, from one leg to the next, the some of the personnel was exchanged and we were resupplied um, yeah, with, with food, but mainly with fuel. And I've been on, on the ship during the first leg. So starting in, in Tromsø and doing the initial setup and doing the first leg. And then during the last leg, so basically the freezing period, but we were already going there on a yeah in, in, in beginning of winter, 
Um, and then in the end, we had to leave when the freezing started. So this freeze up period, these two periods will be mainly what I will be talking about. And actually a bit focusing here now on the, the last part because that's where I just came from or came from some weeks ago. Okay, um, yeah, I will also show some pictures in between. So that was the start of the expedition in Tromsø. You see it already um, was quite dark, um, 20th of September. Yeah, there was a little party and then uh, Markus Rex, the leader of the expedition and uh, the captain were brought on board and then we were leaving. Um, yeah, now presenting some of the motivations for, for why, why should one do that? Why are we drifting for one year through the Arctic? Yeah, one of the main motivations, as probably most of you have heard, is a very strong decrease in, in sea ice and the very strong warming of the atmosphere. So September 2020, September is always a month of the sea ice minimum in the Arctic. We had the second lowest minimum, and you see here that's how it looked in as yeah as the climatology in the 80s to beginning of the 21st century, and that is usually how it looks now in summer. And yeah, one of the reasons uh, is the warming of the atmosphere, but actually also the the, the ocean. So there's uh, what we call Arctic amplification, a stronger warming of surface. Um, temperature in the Arctic compared to the rest of the globe. Um, we see here that in the Arctic to um, compared to the reference period, um, we have uh, warming from yeah, in this reddish colors between two um, or two above four degrees. Maybe I use a different pointer here. And um, yeah, this warming, if we are looking now at a map, is actually ex especially enhanced in the um, Atlantic sector of the Arctic. And that is exactly where we did our drift. So previous experiment, maybe the one which could be comp compared to, um, to the mosaic drift would be the Sheba expedition, which was done in the Beaufort Sea. This is a region here of thicker ice north of um, the Canadian archipelago, Greenland and Alaska. Um, so, so that was uh, more than 20 years ago. And now we were more targe targeting this uh, region of faster drifting ice and the transpolar drift with a very strong warming signal. And between this 20 years, there were many other expeditions, also a lot of expeditions actually from, from by, by, by Russia, Russian colleagues, and also some smaller boats, but never, on such a dimension or with the research icebreaker. So we have this loss of more than 40% of summer um, sea ice compared to the climatology. And that can be seen here. And so this, these are the, yeah, um, the annual cycle from the 70s to 2020. So you see there's always a big change in sea ice area um, from winter up here 16 million square kilometers to summer, where we are nowadays below 4 million square kilometers. Um, so the annual trend is about 4.5% per decade, but the summer trend is quite enhanced by um, th that we're having a decrease by about 13% per decade. And uh, 2020 was again a very low year, the second lowest on the record, 2012 being the lowest one. And this is data we are producing um, in our group here on a daily basis. Uh, so that's not maybe completely updated now, but one can see here in red 2020, uh, very low values and in particular, it was um, very low here in July when the Russian Arctic had an absolute minimum. And that was also when we again, were going north to, to finish our drift of mosaic. Um, yeah, and in black here is 2012, but compared to, to the climatology, all these last years are really, really low. So uh, what were the main, main scientific focus areas of a mosaic? Um, that is mainly about feedbacks and about modeling. So we here are some examples. So uh, for example, about atmospheric vertical stability, surface heat fluxes from the ocean through the snow and ice to the atmosphere and in leads. How is that then co connected to the clouds? Uh, horizontal heat uh, transports uh, into the Arctic 
ocean ice atmosphere coupling, um, uptake of heat in the ocean, then particularly in summer when there are leads uh, opening and uh, more open water areas, darker open water is, uh, um, is available for the sun um, to warm up. And yeah, also planetary waves, tropo uh, troposphere, stratosphere coupling. Um, and this is all quantitatively linked to the hemispheric changes in, in the Arctic. So looking also at teleconnection patterns and then to the rest of the globe, um, how do weather regimes uh, and extremes are changing. And this is only one part being out there doing the measurements. And now the work is starting to understand those processes and uh, put them into models to improve our um, understanding of the climate system and in particular the Arctic climate system. Yeah, storms, another thing. Okay, so that's the overall objective. Then now for, for, for snow and ice, um, yeah, it's, it's then one part of, of, of this couple system. And there in particular, we were looking at uh, process understanding of seasonal changes uh, as well as their spatial variability. So uh, one big thing also in terms of satellite remote sensing right now is looking at snow. So snow cover and sea ice, but also on deformation. So we can always have the sea ice is not static, so it can ridge or it can be pulled apart so that you have leads opening. Um, in summer, we are getting smaller flows, which are melting. So then we have ice free period or with very low ice concentration, initial growth again. So that's what we wanted to observe. And also then the interaction with, for example, the biogeochemistry and the ecosystem. And yeah, for me particular, my group then also to develop new remote sensing methods based on that. Just a few pictures now mainly, how did that look? So in winter, it was really just dark. So we had polar and frozen and just some light around it, uh, quite strong flashlights. And then there were people on the ice and small stations where the research was going on within the vicinity of about 500, 600 meters. So we went into the ice um, when we still had daylight. Uh, we had academic Fedorov accompanying us um, who did um, bring out more buoys and also provided fuel in the beginning so that Polar Stern was really completely full when we started the drift and more equipment. We then were uh, searching for a flow, which wasn't easy because in 2019 it was also very thin ice. So we used satellite data then to identify flows and they were actually tracked by the Russian Arctic and Antarctic. Um, institute and uh, in the end we decided for for one flow um, shown here in the background and put around many autonomous measurement stations within about 20 kilometer radius. So we were then because so it was in, in um, October 2019 we so we were in a flow which just, just survived. Um, the summer melts, um, so kind of a second year ice flow, which is the ice which has survived the summer. Um, and it, we did then some calculation where it came from, and it was from very shallow areas in the Laptev Sea, had a lot of sediment, and there's actually a paper by Thomas Krumpen and others about that. Yeah, then we went on, on the ice, um, did some first assessments, first drilling, and um, then decided, okay, it's very thin, actually, the flow in many areas only had 30 centimeters of thickness, but it had some area with very thick ice, very rich ice, and therefore we um, stayed on that flow and yeah, had the hope that we could stay for a complete year. But that was then more challenging as we might have expected. So that was the start of the drift. Basically, uh, uh, 10 days after we uh, had anchored to the flow, there was a little bit of daylight left. So we could put out some of our camp and uh, infrastructure cables and so on with the remaining daylight. But uh, then at the end of uh, leg one, uh, you can see here there are already a lot of ridges and actually the flow had already transformed quite a bit. We had expected that, so it was clear that there usually are always um, cracks and leads that they can open. 
um, also in the middle of the winter, but we had hoped that we uh, would find a flow or uh, could stay um, in a region where during winter time, this might be quite stable and we might have once in a while a deformation event, but it turned out that during the beginning, the first uh, leg, we had that actually on a, on a really weekly basis. And this is a picture from the ship. And then for example, you see they are opened up a crack and then even to a lead, so really wide opening. For example, back here, this is a remote sensing site uh, where we did these measurements, which suddenly were just on the other side of our flow, basically, so or in a different part. And also, yeah, Ocean City, Met Tower, the uh, ROV, the remote underwater vehicle. Yeah, here's a zoom in to the remote sensing site where we already had pulled the now the instrument back. And we had these maps. So in the background, you see some helicopter data. Um, these are airborne laser scanner data. And in one event, th these were shifted by about 400 to 500 meters um, part of our flow. So our initial map where we had our different cities, so the different measurement sites suddenly were completely at different locations and we had to rebuild quite many things. So yeah, that's how it looked here. We had Ocean City was quite flat. Then just the next day, we had gigantic ridges next to it. Open water opened up, uh, yeah, cracks in front of the ship um, and a lot of the cables had to be pulled. Oh, now PowerPoint crashed. I'm sorry for that. I hope this is not going to happen more often. So it was um, really dynamic, a bit more dynamic than we had. So we had to learn very fast that we had to be quite adaptive and put even less infrastructure out uh, than what we had envisioned uh, to be able to um, yeah, react on, on this different deformation events. Okay, I think that's where we were. Oh yeah, and that's for example at the remote sending side where we had our remote sending instrument. Here's UW Brett uh, from the US, actually a micro radio meter, and uh, now now we already attached <laughs> some important parts, the antenna, but it was, was really standing really close to a lead, and we had to pull away instruments from from this crack. So yeah, it was quite some uh, mechanic work actually. Yeah, you see another crack next to the ship. Uh, we had to build ridges. Nothing was really lost. A few instruments frozen into the ice, so measurement uh, devices were lost, but not a lot. Um, so not a big problem, but uh, always a lot of work. Getting the cables out, for example, also was a major challenge then. So that was uh, a little bit like it was during like one. Um, that was how our remote sending site then in the very end looked again. Uh, so we had to rescue it from our first remote sending site, move to a, for a different area, and that I will come back to that later was always the idea. We have different instruments like on the satellites, uh, now basically on, on the ice directly, looking at the similar snow and ice surface. And yeah, um, we had then different stages um, where we had to yeah, move instruments. You can see sometimes there was blowing snow. So the snow was changing on the ground, but yeah, it was actually quite surreal um, yeah, atmosphere sometimes in this remote sending site with the scanning instruments here, a scatterometer from Canada, here a microwave radiometer from, from Spain. So really many, many groups have contributed to this here. Yeah, and that's then basically how it was going back from our work in the evening, um, quite cold, often minus 25 degrees and windy, um, but yeah, quite, quite an experience to work there. So that and now coming to the complete opposite. So then in between many different people went and uh, I could show also uh, a lot of that, but I'm now here focusing a little bit more on, on my experience. And that was then in the very end. So the, like five the, uh, summer to autumn transition. So after after leg one, yeah, we were picked up and leg two, this really winter leg uh, was then actually quite stable. They didn't have so many deformations, but after that leg three, again, um, and when, yeah, it's actually not really spring, was also still winter, but towards 
spring. Um, there, uh, again, a lot of storms came in and had, there was a lot of ice deformation. So leg five, um, yeah, it's Corona times. So we had to go to quarantine uh, for two weeks in Bremerhaven. We were one week, everybody just in their own uh, room without any contact. Uh, yeah, that's me here. Um, and then the second week we could come together with this group of people who were going on the ship after we had uh, done two Corona tests. And on 3rd of August, we were then leaving with academic Tryoshnikov, another, another uh, Russian vessel. And uh, yeah, um, on 12th of um, August, we after we've met Pulashtern here, uh, ex exchange of personnel with leg four, we were sailing north as, a, as I've showed in the beginning, um, even crossed the North Pole then on the 19th of August and drifted then for exactly one month, um, and, yeah, 21st of August to 20 September with this new flow, the flow 2.0. From there on, we, we traveled back. We had quite a bit of time, um, which you always have to account for if you're on an icebreaker, because you can get always an ice pressure and get stuck. So one has to leave a bit early. And that left us some time to do some more work in the ice margins um, in, in this one week. And we arrived uh, on the 12th of um, October in Bremerhaven. So that's how our uh, second flow looked. Pulash then here, and this is roughly here the surrounding of the flow. And I will again change this to a laser pointer. Yeah, so it's it's all white and white. I mean, you see some mal ponds even ha having some ice on, but you don't see very well. Again, we show the flow where there was actually a ridge next to Pulash then, so thicker ice. Here are all the remote sensing instruments. Here are all the metrological instruments, so Met City. Here are some ocean measurements. And at here in the very back, maybe you don't see that it's a white hut on white snow, so it's hard to see. Uh, there's the AOV, the underwater uh, roboter, underwater vehicle doing measurements. And this is part here, the balloon of the atmospheric measurements. From above, from a drone that looked like that, flashing here, ridges, and that's how we did it then. We had some roads where people can work. Uh, we had a lot of measurement sites. So all these yellow dots are all measurement sites. Uh, we had areas where people were walking transects with, with measurements. Um, yeah, I will not go through that, but just to give you an ex uh, impression. And again, actually during leg five, the flow was quite stable, not too much deformation, but uh, around us, we again had a lot of openings. Um, the, the port side of Polash Dam was at times there was really open water that people had to go by boat um, to, to do measurements. And you see here also in front of our flow, quite some open water areas opened up. And in contrast to winter, um, we now didn't have refreezing, so that stayed open for a long time. Yeah, just to say, so uh, I will now present a few examples of the ice teamwork during leg five, and this is here the complete team. And on every leg, there were roughly 10 to 14 people doing um, yeah, work for the ice team. We, so we are just continuing what, what they did. Um, and yeah, so I have some names on some 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 of the slides, but uh, they are then now only for this last leg, leg, leg five. Uh, so what are the motivations for the snow and ice measurements? Again, process understanding how and why do snow and ice properties change throughout the season and how do are they connected to the atmosphere and ocean, the feedback to the ecosystem and the biogeochemistry. And like five, now end of summer, the particular focus was on how uh, the transitioning from the melting snow and ice to the refreezing first of the surface. And then the um, ocean freeze up around us would happen. So it's a key time of the year for ice mass balance development where um, ice freeze up is starting and also a strong change of energy flux are happening when these warm ocean gets in contact with the cold atmosphere, ice grows, and then uh, the flux is reduced by that lid of new ice and snow. 
that is uh, for the for the heat exchange, but also in the in the solar spectrum, there's an obviously very strong change because the surface albedo is changing a lot from from the melt ponds um, on the ice, which are getting frozen over, and new snow falling on them, and the leads are refreezing. For, for the microwave satellite measurements, it's uh, very connected to that. So we are transitioning from this very wet surfaces, the snow and even open water and the melt pond, ponds and the leads um, to yeah, uh, refrozen surfaces uh, with um, then yeah, less liquid water and decreased salinity after the refreezing. And sea ice dynamics um, is also a strong change. So in summer, we are basically in free drift. So flows are not so much in, in contact with the other flows um, so that uh, one can solve that with a free drift equation where then the internal ice strength increases if the leads are freezing again. And we see that directly in all our satellite but also buoy-based sea ice drift data. We did observations of the snow and ice surface, undersides, internally, yeah, from the top. And um, yeah, one interesting th uh, thing at that time of the, the season is always that there's a different timing in the surface freezing and the bottom freezing. So you can have the warm ocean still melting the sea ice from below, while from the top, you already have the autumn colder um, atmosphere with freezing air temperatures, which uh, start to freeze over these melt ponds and snow can fall so that you have two processes which even can, yeah, can have a different timing in terms of uh, melting still on, on the one hand while freezing starting from the top. We did some flight by helicopter. Yeah, um, just to, to show it how, how, how uh, were the, the surface changes. In the beginning when we arrived, we had um, open ponds here in the rich area. So these are melt ponds on the thicker ice and this turkey's color here on some thinner ice. They were basically open. There were some warmer temperatures. And um, yeah, before actually when we were traveling, they were slightly refrozen. We were afraid that we would miss the refreezing, but they opened up again. But then um, the freezing started. We had some time of persistent below um, zero degrees uh, air temperatures and some snow were falling on them. And you directly see this very strong change in surface albedo. Um, however, so we again uh, thought, okay, now we are going into the transition to, to winter, but we had another warm event with even um, some rain on the snow. And you see that now some of the ponds got darker again because uh, the snow got wet. They don't, didn't, some opened up uh, again, but not, not all of them or not most of them. But at the very end, um, yeah, everything froze again so that we think we captured this uh, refreezing actually quite well. So what did people do then? Um, again, only for the ice team, you, you one could give the same presentation for all the other four teams. Uh, so there are a lot of measurements um, done. For example, ice scoring, getting such cores, one then can do a lot of uh, measurements um, in terms of the ecology and biogeochemistry. We did physical measurements shown here as temperature and salinity, salinity in green, temperature, um, no, salinity in red, uh, density in, in green and temperature in blue for an ice core. And so that is depth into the ice. And one can, can see here on the top was already cold, minus degree temperature, some warm layer, and then towards the ocean, uh, which is roughly then always at the freezing point uh, if it's fresher water at minus 1.5 or one, minus 1 1.8 degrees centigrade. The pictures, so thin and thick sections of ice cores. So that was coring. Then, for example, people were walking around with, with such devices here, magna probe measuring snow depth and uh, electromagnetic induction device, GAM for measuring eye thickness. Here's just one transect as an example. One meter would be the eye thickness, including snow. So our flow had uh, mainly one meter thick ice with some ridges on it. And we had also frozen in some stakes. And here maybe then the interesting thing. So these are just different stake sites. These are times and these stakes are measuring also eye thickness. And um, the thickness during that one month was basically not unchanged. So we 
actually didn't have a long, a strong melting uh, from the bottom uh, anymore, but we also didn't have any refreezing yet, despite having um, already below zero temperatures, everything was quite warm and quite in equilibrium. So these are just examples. There are many more measurements, but one uh, I find interesting was that uh, our Russian colleagues put out a seismic or actually four seismic stations where one then can see deformation events. So here are yeah, the t t uh, three different comp component of the seismometer. And here are uh, the, the wind speed. And we had one cracking event, which then directly was observed in the seismic stations. We did a lot of albedo measurements um, shown here now, yeah, um, how fast it can change within one week from open water in some of the melt ponds, getting already a little ice layer um, to then um, a week later, more solid ice cover, which then even with some snow on top. And that can also be seen in a time series. So here's now the broadband um, albedo versus time. And we see first there were a lot of melt ponds, so some variability, um, but um, that is uh, the ice along one transect line, uh, the albedo um, along one transect line, uh, quite low due to the melt ponds. And we had this freeze up event, uh, albedo increasing, getting quite high with some snowfall. However, then we had this rain on the snow event, warm temperatures again, which directly decreased the albedo before we had refreezing. And similar things one could observe here in the spectral albedo. We had an underwater robot um, here in this hut where then someone was sitting and looking at the images. And this robot then can, for example, ROV, a remote operated vehicle, can observe here Fresnel ice uh, buildings. So the freezer processes under the ice, but we even observed um, animals, uh, not only seals, there were also other. Um, smaller animals to be observed under the ice. And one can do then mapping of the under, um, ice underside. And we did the same by helicopter from the top. So here's polar stern and then such uh, patterns were done by this uh, ROV. And here's one example how that then changed during our time. So this is from uh, beginning of September, 8th of September. Shown in colors is the transmissi transmissivity through the ice. So uh, um, brighter colors or more yellowish colors means that more ice, uh, more sunlight, more radiation was going through the snow and ice into the ocean. And in particular then through some of the cracks and some of the melt ponds. And at the end of our visit, um, 17th of September, or this is not even at the, really at the, uh, yeah, it's only 10 days difference here. Um, after some snowfall, um, the transmissivity went down or transmittance went down um, a lot. And one can also see that in the probability density functions where in the beginning uh, we had still a broad distribution of uh, trans transmittances here around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. And after the snowfall, um, only very low transmittance values were left. Snow, uh, again, was another focus. And here is uh, a micro CT image um, where one really can look into details in the snow structure. These were done on a basically day daily basis, but also then a lot of transects and yeah, snow microstructure, see um, specific surface area of the snow crystals, optical properties thermal connectivity, dielectric properties, surface roughness, um, salinity, density, yes, obviously the snow depth um, and permeability um, bubbles and pores. So that was always one of these little sleds full of equipment and doing a lot of those measurements and snow pits. We also deployed buoys uh, around the ship. Again, we were visited by a seal, so we did that on, on foot and the surrounding, but also by helicopter um, flying about 20 kilometers away. From the helicopter, we did also such <clears throat> maps. This was now again during winter time. Here's Polarstern, 
And these are airborne, airborne laser scanner maps where one then can see where all the ridges are. And they can be put together with this ROV, underwater vehicle maps, um, that we get a full 3D uh, reconstruction of the topography, which is important, for example, for our um, energy ex exchanges in terms of surface drag um, to the ocean and yeah, wind. On the helicopter, we had also an infrared camera um, now from, from summer here, where one can see all these melt ponds, um, which have a little bit of snow on, on or in the ice margins. Uh, no, no, this is now in our crack, with some new ice on and uh, next to it and smaller ice flows. And yeah, we have those for not the summer, but for all the, the winter time and um, spring and autumn parts. Okay, um, the, the remainder of the time, I'd like to talk a little bit about the remote sensing work we did. And the main research question there were, how well do satellite algorithms perform in the central Arctic um, for parameters such as CI thickness, snow depths, ice types, flow size distribution, ice concentration, ice drift and deformation. Um, how do we want to do that uh, by uh, asking the question, can co-located ground-based sea, uh, sea ice and snow, optical and microwave measurement help to develop improved satellite retrieval methods for, again, the same parameters? And then can we use um, some of the more regional data, like the helicopter data, to upscale from these very localized uh, measurements next to um, Polarstern and to Pan-Arctic domain? And why a mosaic? Yeah, it's really the rare case to observe the complete seasonal cycle, including winter observations. Yeah, I, I talked about that. So we had, again, a very low sea ice extent. We uh, have a very big loss of sea ice. We know it's decreasing uh, very strongly. We know all that from satellite data, and it's very certain that all that is happening. However, um, still, uh, current algorithms have actually quite some uncertainties. So I will not go here into the details, but here is um, a different algorithm channel combinations using different frequencies in the microwave domain. And yeah, it's, um, they are standard deviation compared to a reference data set, so uh, some uncertainty measure, uh, measurements. And roughly right now with uh, algorithms using normally about 19 and 30, 37 gigahertz, we have an uncertainty of about 5%. Um, if we are using higher spatial resolution data, higher frequencies, uh, the um, error is even increasing due to a stronger atmospheric influence. But what we want to have is something well below 3%. And some algorithms already can do that. But we are actually also getting new satellites for that. For example, in Europe, the uh, SIMR mission, the Copernicus Im Imaging Microwave Radiometer, which will be launched in a few years. And that will have a larger uh, dish, so larger antenna. And um, yeah, we can use newer methods um, to derive new algorithms. And for example, we had one instrument for that satellite on, on the ice flow. And to do that, um, we also need better process understanding. So we need better microwave emission modeling. Uh, and that is in particular needed if we want to derive new parameters like snow depths or eye thickness, where snow also plays a, a, a role. And yeah, we, uh, focus obviously was now a lot of new satellites. So ISA-2 is in, in orbit. There were measurements done by, by NASA, sending also two or three people um, on Mosaic and for upcoming um, EU Copernicus missions like Simmer or Crystal, uh, Crystal is an uh, altimeter. Yeah, so how do we do? We, we have to, to, be, to better understand our signal measured by the satellite. We have to understand the interaction of microwaves with the snow and sea ice. So um, yeah, if we don't want to do it very empirically, like we are doing now actually a lot, we need better models for that. And yeah, that is a little bit of a challenge because snow and ice is actually quite complex uh, to model in the microwave domain, but we already have some models which actually can model a lot of processes. However, they are not very constrained because there are many unknowns. We don't know all these distribution of 
uh, brain pockets, air bubbles, the salinity in general in the snow and ice. We don't know the snow grain sizes and so on. Um, also salinity in the snow. So there are many unknowns. So field measurements are really needed. Um, for the atmosphere, it's a bit better. It's especially at low frequencies. Actually, they are quite robust forward models for, for the atmosphere, uh, but we also have to take that into, in, uh, into account. So we are doing field measurements during Mosaic to understand that better. Um, and yeah, how, how does CS look like from a microwave perspective or how do we model that? Yes, we have the ocean water. Uh, usually we know the temperatures at the freezing point or close to that. We have some idea about the salinity, but then we have to, to model quite inhomogeneous medium, the sea ice, which is ice with some brine pockets in it and the snow on top uh, with changing uh, liquid water content, changing salinity, changing grain sizes, which um, can scatter at higher microwave frequencies. Uh, so one, one needs to model that in different layers. In general, we had a really good support by space agencies for uh, mosaics. That was, um, or a lot of that was um, coordinated through the WMO Polar Space Task Group, especially for the synthetic aperture radar images. So either increased Sentinel-1 cov uh, coverage, um, also some collaboration with JAXA, um, and provided instruments on the ice. We had the Canadian Space Agency providing RADAR-2 images and uh, radar and constellation mission data. Um, then there was some funding and co collaboration with UMITSAT um, for bringing some instruments on the ice, the scatterometers. NASA had an on ice program for ISA 2, DLR for TerraSIDA X, yeah, JAXA provided ALOS 2 images, the Italian Space Agency, Cosmos SkyMed, um, the Korean Space Agency, and COPRI, COMSAT um, 5 SAR images, but also optical images from COMSAT 2 and 3. And we had SAOCOM from Argentina and CNES. Yeah, that didn't work out, but we tried to get also optical Pleiades images at least. Yeah, we, had, we tried that. And even here, Spain is mi missing, with, which in collaboration with DLR provided um, pass images. So again, yeah, this, these are on our instruments on the ice. For example, a scatterometer here from Canada. Here's a microfarad-meter from University of Manitoba. UW, uh, Brett from the Johnson Group in the US. Uh, Emirat, uh, no, Elbara, Elband radiometer here provided by ESA, built in Switzerland. Uh, another scatterometer from from Canada um, and so on. Ah, yeah, here's a KUKA radar for crystal. So we have this, such uh, instruments all the time on the ship. Not They were not operational all the time. There were always sometimes some failures. Here's some GNSSR measurements, but we always uh, maintain could maintain them so that we get the time through, through the year. And that is now at the end of the campaign. So similar pictures, similar instrument. One new one here, for example, Hutrat, another microwave radiometer. And again, looking at snow and ice. We had also visitors um, during leg two. There was a polar bear actually playing around with one of the micro radiometers and no one saw that bear. It was actually only uh, captured by, by one of our cameras uh, because people wondered why the radiometer was looking in a different uh, direction. And we had the same during, uh, during the daytime, during like five, uh, we had also a um, polar bear, unfortunately, again, doing no harm, just being very curious and destroying some of our measurement side by walking through the snow. So yeah, validation of remote sensing data set with field measurements. Uh, as I've said, it's really, it's this rare, rare case that we can uh, observe the complete seasonal cycle. And we don't on, only have the measurements on that one spot, we have uh, at least a snow and ice measurements in a larger area by having a distributed grid of autonomous measurement devices, which are then more representative on a satellite footprint scale. And we have, have helicopter campaign, campaigns to bridge um, towards the satellite data. These were is, uh, a sketch done before the campaign, how we wanted to do it. And we actually did it roughly like that. Uh, the concept worked fine in particular for having everything on sleds to be quite mobile. 
Um, and what is important that we are not just measuring um, in the microwave domain or just doing our measurements, we need all the snow and ice sampling really close by. And the goal is to better understand microwave emissions, scattering of ice and snow, season cycle, melt refreeze to improve um, forward models for in the microwave domain. We'll also not go through all those instruments, but just to give an overview of what we had on the ice flow. So we had reflected GPS measurements here, GNSSR, we had infrared camera, just usual, usual webcam, had my different microwave radiometers here in the middle, and then have added active instruments, uh, KUK band radar, for example, for this crystal altimeter mission to get eye thickness, uh, different scatterometers, which were, would be then more comparable to SAR data. And yeah, here's another radiometer. And but what I don't have here, we also had instruments on the ship, uh, three more instruments on the ship. Just a few impressions, how the remote sensing uh, site looked during summer. So this is from the ship, this was behind a ridge next to a melt pond we also observed. Um, and yeah, um, there were, this were more on the sunny days, there were actually also worse days than that. Now just some examples, very preliminary results. Uh, one ex ex um, instrument, this is KUK band radar, dual frequency radar, which can also scan under um, yeah, different incidence angles, but in particular it's built for NADI observation to be compared or to better understand the signals from radar altimeters, which are used like cryosat to, to, de, um, to derive eye thickness. And now with upcoming missions, we want to have two different frequencies um, on, the, uh, on this, and that will, is going to happen with the crystal mission uh, to be coming. And th that should allow to also measure the snow depth on top of the ice. And one can already do it right now by combining two satellites, uh, Cryosat 2 and Altica. However, Altica is only uh, going up to 81.5 degrees north. So it's uh, actually not, for example, where we were now in the Arctic, it's more uh, south of that. Some initial results. So these are the backscatter um, here shown for the KU band and the background but here tracked um, for KA band two, so to two frequencies. And the automatic tracker actually doesn't find a big difference here between the black and the green curve. However, if one is looking here in the background, one sees that there is a lower layer and one can plot on top the snow uh, profile now. And one can see that there is actually quite some co correspondence roughly at least to the snow depth. And yeah, some of these initial results were actually just published uh, a week ago in the cryosphere. Another example, what we want to understand now from a radiometer passive instrument uh, running at uh, three different frequencies, but here shown just for 19 gigahertz, horizontal and vertical. And these are not, not real brightness temperature measurements, but just uh, what is preliminary data, just observation counts. And on the bottom plot here um, is the air temperature plotted. So the time on the X axis and uh, yeah, temperature on the Y and here, um, yeah, just the raw measurements. And what we can see when we had a warming event that we had a very strong change uh, in our measurements. And these measurements directly would influence our sea ice concentration re retrievals on the satellite um, too. And that's what we want to understand yeah, because, for example, then the air temperature stayed quite high above uh, zero degrees, but uh, mm, brightness temperatures actually changed back to the value before close to that. Here an example what happened if we are looking not at a snow and ice surface, but off onto a refrozen melt pond. Again, very strong change in the brightness temperature. Um, and also these, these melt ponds are part of uh, what we are observing with a satellite microwave radiometer. So we have to take those into account and we now have more detailed measurements to do that. For a different um, radiometer um, called SSMI because it has similar frequency as that satellite. Yeah, and th these are actually the frequencies used currently, like what we are doing in, in, in our group for CIS concentration retrieval. And here's another example now, uh, again, a time series air temperature when it was rising up um, close to zero, a little bit above. 
we see a very strong change in the brightness temperature at both 89 gigahertz and 19 gigahertz. And uh, yeah, we see that also in summer, our ice concentration estimates are getting, um, having bigger uncertainties. Um, it's not, not, not that we didn't expect that, but we need to understand those processes better. And that's what we are having the data for now. What other people did, like three, Lars uh, Kaleschke, Reza Nadepur, for example, they also did an experiment by just removing some snow and looking of how the brightness temperature is changing due to that. We see a decrease in most channels and in one channel, 19 horizontal, we see a very strong change, which we are not quite understanding. So that is in future work uh, to be done. And to iterate that again, we not only need these microwave measurements, we need this very intense snow and ice sampling program. And that what people were then doing next to the remote sensing time uh, site on a, on a daily basis, doing all kinds of physical measurements. Okay, and then uh, in September, we are back uh, and arriving 12th of October, and we had actually a very nice welcome in Bremerhaven. Uh, Luckily, quite good weather. Weather forecast was, was actually not so good. So there was, were a lot of ships out welcoming Polar Stern after being away for more than a year. Um, yeah, but due to Corona, there was not a big, big party, but it was still quite impressive to be on board coming back to Germany. Some conclusions for um, the remote sensing measurements. So we, we put out the, the largest collection of microwave remote sending instruments on, on drifting sea ice. So such a diff, uh, range of uh, instruments were really uh, never put together before. And this was only possible by the support by a lot of space agencies and uh, a, a lot of research groups who provided their instruments in this common effort. So we had microwave radiometers measuring emissivity from half a gigahertz to 90 uh, gigahertz. Uh, we had active instrument uh, me measuring backscatter from one gigahertz to 35 gigahertz. And all those were basically done on the uh, same snow and sea ice. Um, so we have, while not for most instrument to complete uh, season cycle without gaps, but we are having measurements from different times of the year, quite continuous. Um, at least some of the instruments were always operational. In addition to that, we had that what I discussed this KUKA band radar from, for snow depth retrieval, reflected GNSS measurements in summer, I haven't shown that, a hyperspectral camera um, all the time, but more useful in winter, infrared measurements. And some of the instruments we could pull around, like shown here. Um, not all of them, most were too heavy to pull them really far, but KUK band radar and Ariel and L band radiometer, we did transects. And already the preliminary data shows um, influences on, on these signals like melt refreeze events, um, changing snow types and snow depth. Mel pond development, um, different um, emissivities and backscatter for depending on ice type and incidence angle. So we think that we have the data to, to, um, to get in future to our goal to better understand um, snow uh, and ice emission and scattering at microwave frequencies to improve um, snow and ice radiative transform models. And with that, I yeah, like to come to an end and Hope that there might be a few questions. Yeah, thank you, Gunnar. That was very nice. <laughs> thank you. Very beautiful pictures. And with a, so I think it was a good combination of science and nice pictures, as I had hoped. Uh, if Someone has a question, please switch on your microphone and your camera. There should be a few questions. Don't be shy. At least some comments. <laughs> 
So you know where to do the fake moon, moon landing. Yeah, you can select Arctic sea ice, Roland. That's really looking. Yeah, like. well, it, it, one of your pictures there, uh, the the yeah. illumination and all the instrumentation there on the ice that, that, and the dark sky that really look very much like scenes from the moon. And I have to say, it, it really felt like that because you were also like you had to dress up so much so that it wasn't feeling mm -hmm. like working on a normal environment and always having this very shallow light from the vessel. Um, which yeah was giving yeah really like a little bit out of out of space um, impression yeah I hadn't done that before I have been on quite some expedition but doing this winter um, measurements was was quite quite interesting. Okay, there is a question from Mac in the chat. Uh, how are you handling the co-location between different sensors having different resolutions? It seems yeah, like I, I a lot of work. Yeah, do you mean now the uh, satellite measurements? So there, in, indeed, it's actually probably not possible um, to do. Uh, so our aim is not now to do, to really compare the satellite measurements on our mosaic ice flow. I mean, there's also so much stuff on it. I mean, we don't really can understand that in terms of SAR data or whatever data with all the stuff we put on. The eyes. Yeah, we we always have to make the step from from understanding how, for example, now uh, different eye surfaces, the younger eyes, the older eyes, the more deformed eyes, um, and so on, are um, showing up in in in, in backscatter or in, in the micro radiometers and changing with environmental conditions. And we have if we have the, have that, then we can uh, transfer it to the satellite measurements, and then we have to do that on different scales. Yes, we have to take into account the spatial variability within the footprint, which indeed is one of the major challenges. Yeah, polarimetric studies. Um, people started with that, so. Um, the scatterometers from, from Canada, they, um, some of them are fully polarimetric. Um, so we really have kind of quad pole data there. And um, um, for the uh, radiometers, some also, most at least have two, two polarization. And so we have, we're doing basically polarimetric studies at, uh, at the same time, multi-frequency. So um, yeah, looking really at different frequencies and um, or polarizations. Yeah, there's a question from Will Grandin here. I don't know why nobody wants to show their faces here, but so Will asked in the chat. Uh, the biogeochemical measurements. measurements. Um, Biogeochemical. Yeah, so I think from what I've heard by just interactions on the ship, um, so, so th there's the people who are really in situ people. So they did a lot of measurements uh, in the melt ponds, under the ice, um, uh, fluxes uh, through snow, thin ice, and so on. Uh, and yeah, and a lot of the chemical analysis of that. Um, so there, I ha haven't seen a lot of um, satellite people, but we had actually quite some interactions because also for them, if they want to upscale any of the observations, they will need some satellite data for that to understand how many melt points are there if, if we have processes observed there, how many leads are there. So um, there we are engaging now actually in interactions to, to do that together. I see David Katko is making some Strange comments there. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm not making a mess of typing it in, but uh, Will, uh, there was a very big group called the BG, BGC group, which I was part of. Uh, I, I, I think it's now it's not appropriate to go with all the details, but if you want to contact me, I can tell you all about all the measurements that were made. Uh, Aguna, that was a great talk, by the way. I don't think we've met. But, no, uh, I don't think so. Nice uh, to meet you. Yeah, as well in, in, in that group. And anyway, there were gas fluxes. Uh, a lot of organic compound measurements. I was measuring beryllium seven as a tracer of atmospheric input. Uh, it was quite a large group. And, and if you have any questions, you can contact me and I'll uh, explain more about it to you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I completely agree. So uh, for all these different topics, one can do an even longer presentation as my already long presentation. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of measurements. Um, so, 
and uh, and there should be a lot of interaction to to understand them so again i would prefer if people ask their questions via the camera so, we, so they can be included better in our recording but there is a new question in the chat was there any continuous surface flux measurements over the open ocean from buoys or something like that? Yeah, open ocean now sounds like uh, so. I mean, we are, we were always now yeah, maybe not in the very end of like four where they were drifting very close to the ice edge, and there was also quite some larger open water areas. Um, uh, but most of the time, there were open ocean would have been in leads, so in, in smaller areas. And yeah, uh, it's probably not so much. I mean, yes, people went to Leeds doing some measurements there, but it's indeed uh, uh, the hard part. So you, you put buoys often somewhere on, on the flow, maybe even close to, to an edge. Um, Naya, yeah, um, yeah, maybe is that true? We did some measurements. I mean, people were also going out with by boat on, on some of these leads opening and doing measurements. So there might be, be some, but definitely uh, challenging to directly measure over the open ocean uh, next to the flow. So we, we had buoys, but we mainly didn't deploy them I mean, these are then small cracks openings, and you not usually don't deploy a buoy there. It might be the next day, it might be crushed uh, again. So the buoys uh, were usually deployed on the ice, and if they are melting out, some of them are floating. But um, yeah. Hello. Yes, I have a question, please. Um, very nice presentation, first of all, and. Um, as you know, there's there's many different ice types, uh, but the the satellite products, you know, primarily just will. Uh, there's a percentage of first year ice versus uh, multi year ice, so it's very broad categories, and these are you know themselves some relatively experimental products compared to just the ice concentration, and and so given the complexity of these, these processes and the number of different ice types and then kind of the, the mismatch between uh, satellite, you know, ground sample sizes versus, you know, the typical melt pond size and some of these other sort of micro scales. Do, do you think it's realistic to kind of in the looking in the future, is the goal more to just improve ice concentration products, which kind of are existing to just kind of make those more accurate? Or do you think in, in the future that, that when we're creating satellite products that give sort of you know, detailed uh, ice types and uh, melt pond concentrations and this sort of thing? Yeah, so yeah, definitely. I think we, we, we can go in that direction. But, but you, uh, what you said in the beginning is first uh, that even for, for us humans, it's not so easy to, to, to say what ice types are there. So even if you are there, it's not easy to describe. Um, then one has to go again back to, to the microwave perspective. And there we see indeed quite some differences like now on these ice, which might have survived one summer. So it has lost quite some salinity, some brine already due, due to the summer melt. However, this is still quite different from uh, ice, which is five year old, uh, closer to the Canadian coast, um, very thick, or, um, so also radiometrically, uh, you directly see that. And specifically now that we are having uh, coming up um, better accuracy microwave radiometer data, but also more coverage with SAR data and more polarimetric data with SAR. I think we are on a, on a good way to, to discriminate more ice classes, but then we also have to kind of name them and understand them. What do they now really mean in terms of our climate system or maybe also shipping or what people are interested in? Um, and I hope that we collected some data to 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 walk and in, work into that direction. Are you working on any products where you're kind of fusing um, the SAR and the radiometer type type imagery to to try to improve uh, algorithm performance? So in my group, we are working on this lower resolution SAR like Sentinel-1. So more looking at the, the Pan-Arctic scale. And there we are having an, an elite 
classification products. Um, and now it's then we are back to what ice types are these. So we can identify leads quite well. So open, open water areas or thin ice areas and that we already cannot discriminate so, so well always. Um, that's what we are doing, but we are in, uh, in one project here with uh, DLR and uh, they are more looking into the higher resolution Terrasa X images, um, full polarimetric um, to, to combine that and even with, with different frequencies. So ALOS2 um, to look in more specific uh, classifications of ice types. And we are only one group uh, doing that, um, yeah, in, in Canada, at least I know the uh, groups are doing that. And then in, in Norway and Tromsø is one group doing that. So there are at least yeah, three, four groups um, working in that di direction, but uh, more people are, are welcome too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any further questions and it has been quite long already. So let's say thank you again, Gunnar, that was really a fantastic presentation, uh, very nice uh, pictures, uh, very well presented and nice that you agreed to do this uh, so close to Christmas and you probably are busy with a lot of other things. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending the seminar. Uh, we will now take a break until January 27. I think uh, Shane Elipo will be the next uh, speaker, so watch your emails for the next seminar announcement. Happy holidays and that's it. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Roland, uh, for the invitation, and I um, was really happy to be here virtually with you. Yeah. So yeah, maybe when when all this is over, we can invite you for for an in-person visit. We have a few people here, like John and some others, who are working on CIs. So maybe we can start some stronger mm -hmm. collaboration with you. You must visit Sea Stars on your next visit to Miami. Yes. Yeah. Sea Stars is our satellite. Okay, Sounds so uh, let's uh, finish the recording here. Don't don't start the new conversation now. I will stop the recording now.